Today, we know, is a, a, a Palm Sunday. Amen? Amen. And we know that Jesus entered Jerusalem. Amen? Right. Amen? Now, that's sort of where this message is going to go off of is uh, what Jesus was there for. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You don't answer it. Well, if you can't, if you want, it may be wrong. But, what does, we say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. They said it. But do you know what Hosanna means? It's two words. The last two letters, N-A, are a different word than the first part. Okay? It means save now. That's what they was. See, they was wanting to be delivered of the political system of the Romans. That's what they was wanting Jesus to do when the triumphal entry came. They was wanting, they was looking forward to Jesus setting up His kingdom. Even the disciples did. But that wasn't Jesus' purpose at that moment. His mind and His heart was on one thing. And that was you. For five days, five days, He entered Sunday, did He not? Thursday, they took Him took him to Cephas' house. Correct? On Thursday. Yeah, well, Thursday is five days. So five days at the triumphal entry, Jesus was still talking about the lost, getting saved, judgment coming. He was doing that and not thinking on what He was going to go through. He was thinking about us. And He was still mind on winning the lost. Read it. Matter of fact, you can go to Matthew 21. 21, yeah. You can start there in your Bibles and look at the topics. Just go to the topics. It says, you know, about the two sons, about the ten virgins, and it goes on and on about the fig tree. Judgment coming. You can use it for faith, but it's also about judgment coming. See, Jesus had it all on His mind. The thing Jesus never forgot, and He said it in Luke 2.49, I must be about my Father's business. And Luke 19.10, what did He say? I seek and save the lost. He did He... Jesus lived... What Jesus said, Jesus did. Did Jesus live by them principles? Absolutely so. He wanted to please His Father. And He did. What was the Father? You've got to understand. The Christian walking tells a lot of things, Okay? But the main one thing it entails is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And out of that relationship, just like out of marriage, you're going to do things. And the things that we should be doing, we're not doing. And that's winning the lost. That was Jesus' whole purpose in a triumphal entry. Five days. Then what they do? They march him over to Cephas' house. I've been there. Over to Cephas' house. And they took him downstairs in a... You know, it wasn't even no bigger than about this right here, dirt floor, obviously. And that's where Jesus was during the night. After they interrogated Him stuff, they took Him down there. And it's just, just a dirt floor, and this, this, they was upstairs. But Jesus was still had you on His mind. He had you on His mind when He went to Calvary. If not, if not, then let me ask you this question. How's come Jesus said to the people that was crucifying Him and everything, forgive them, they know not what they do? Where was His mind at? It was on the lost. He could not stand to see the lost lost. That was His complete drive. And I'll tell you this, and you can find it, I ain't going to turn there for the sake of time, I don't reckon, but in John, I mean John, Acts 9.31, Matter of fact, we're not. I know I told you to go to Mark. Let's just let's just go. Let's go to Mark. Forget this. We'll we'll, we'll get to it here in a minute. Mark chapter ten, verses thirty-two through thirty-four. I'm not political correct in everything. My words, I, I pronounce them a little different in everything. But if you will listen with your hearts, you will open your hearts up. Matter of fact, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask right now. Holy Spirit, that You would help us 
to open our hearts up, Lord, our spiritual ears right now, to hear the words that You have to say, not what I have to say, but You through me, Lord. And if, Father, if somebody never hears nothing, Lord, may they hear You speaking to them, Lord. May they feel Your presence. May You give them a word of encouragement, Lord, that as Pastor Gary said, Lord, they will not go out these doors the way they came in. They will go out encouraged. They will go out on fire. They will go out as giant killers today, Lord, knowing who they are in Christ, Father. May Your anointing rest upon this Word, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mark chapter 10, verse 32. Now, they were on the road going to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed, and they followed. They were afraid. Then He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to Him. Verse 33. Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes. The scribes are the lawyers of the day. And they will condemn Him to death and deliver Him to the Gentiles. And they will mock Him, scourge Him, and spit on Him, and kill Him. And the third day He will rise again. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things in this passage. Is they, in verse 34, they mocked him, scourged him, and scourge means they beat him. Let me explain that. Let me explain that. They had a whip, and if you've ever seen the, the, the Passion of Christ, that, that does a pretty good job. But they had a whip that they tied pieces of bone and glass in. And they just didn't hit it, they dipped it in water. That made. Have you ever been uh, uh, slapped with like a branch when it's cold out in the woods or something? That, how it hits, boy, it hurts. Well, that's not incomparable to what that was. But the idea was, is dipping that in water, and when I slung that, that it was flat like a spit wad on the wall, but when you pulled that back, skin came with it. Yeah. And you imagine your skin just being ripped, ripped off. That is painful. And once again, he was thinking about you. Yeah, that's right. Understand this, and we'll get into this in communion. But Jesus, through his body, by his stripes, we are healed. He made a way for your healing. That's right. Through that, see how much he cared? He just didn't save us, right. he did not just save you. He made a way you can be healed and walk in health. It's up to us, and people say, I don't believe it. Well then, you know, I'm getting tired of people saying they don't believe this, they don't believe that. Here's the Word of God. Whether you believe it or not, I don't even care. You know what? I know it's true. I've seen the Lord. If you don't believe the Bible, then what in the world are we even doing here? These churches that's got homosexual pastors and preachers and deacons and all, and you wonder why the judgment of the Lord's coming... They say this is not irrelevant today. And you say, well, why do we pick on all that all the time? We don't pick on drunkenness and and adultery. I do. But here's the thing. When it comes to homosexuality, it comes to adultery, it comes to fornication, you're going against the image of God. And it carries a lot more weight with, yes, sin, sin, all sin, unconfessed, will send you to hell. But when we go against the image of God, it, it shows a society that is deprived. It's reached the bottom. And our society right now is reaching the bottom. And listen, if things do not turn around, if revival does not turn things around, probably everyone in this room is going to hear that trumpet sound and the Lord come. I believe, I believe in pre-trib. I believe the Bible teaches it. Not that I want to get out of what's going on. I believe, you know, I'm not here to teach that. But I believe, you know, what the Word says. Amen. Amen? And that's what I'm getting to. Do you really believe this? Yes. What's uh, 1 Timothy say? 3.16? All Scripture, what? Is given. So whose Word is it? This is God's Word. And we want to say the Bible is not irrelevant to this. Do you understand that these churches like... Uh, 
I don't care, Church of Christ that has that uh, red chalice on it. Them, them, them churches, like there's one down at Terre Haute going down on 40, and there's all around, they believe in homosexuality. Do you know that that church, that church back in, I believe it was 78, somewhere in there, they was the one that paid to get homosexuals in Congress and all this started. I may not came to tell you anything today that maybe you didn't know, but I did come to do this, as Peter said. I come to stir you up by reminding you of these things. I don't believe anybody here in this assembly right here is ignorant of the Word. I believe you all know the Word. But as we come together, what's the purpose in it to stir one another up for good works? Amen? Amen? Amen. And the thing is, we cannot... We, we, we've got to be out about the Father's business and winning the lost. We can't sit in these pews. You cannot sit in these pews. Listen, how many times you heard, okay, I want to change the carpet in this church and uh, I want it to be blue. Okay, Chris says, no, I want it green. Linda says, no, I want it red. And so what happens? You have a big argument, huh? Or, I don't want these pews, I want some uh, movie theater seats. And we have this bickering. Let me tell you something. If we would get our focus right and be out winning the lost, your mindset would not be, you wouldn't care if this carpet was purple. You would not care because you would have the heart of the Lord in winning the lost. You won't, listen, you wouldn't have all the bickering in church. I get, I get tired of hearing the bickering of this. Or, well, do you see what they wore? Who cares if your mind, your heart, is the heart after Christ? Yeah. You're going to be worried about all that. This is not a heaven or hell issue. And that's the thing. If it's not a heaven or hell issue, what do you even argue about? Even with a husband and wife. Who cares? Who cares? If she wants a blue car and he wants a green car, who cares? Let her have a blue car. Right. You'll be a lot happier, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Ain't that right, Pastor Gary? Right. Okay. Now, we know that it cost Jesus, it would cost Jesus his life. See, Jesus was willing to pay the cost. What was the cost? The cost was his life for a lost soul. What about us? See, we can't, we can't even get over ourselves. We want our own ways, our own pleasures, our own money. Uh, and there's nothing wrong spending time with the family. You need to. That's part of it. But we spend all our time there and never go out. We never talk to nobody. And not putting anybody on the spot, not trying to make anybody feel guilty. That's not what I'm doing. But when's the last time that we talk to someone about the Lord? And you know, some people say, well, I do it by a smile. That's a cop-out. That is making you feel good. I'm not saying maybe you don't walk by somebody. Everybody you, you uh, run into contact to may ne necessarily, the Lord may not want you to say something. They've got to be drawn. But pretty much everybody I meet, I talk to about the Lord, they say, well, that's because you're, you're, you're a pastor, you're a vanist. No, it ain't. I've done that all my life. I love the Lord. I want everybody else to, to know about the Lord. Do you understand that I don't know exactly how it's going to be, but we'll just say it is. I don't know what it is. There's people that's in hell. What if, let's put it that way. What if they came up to you, John, and they said, John, we're in hell burning here and it, it's hot and everything else. Why did you not tell me about Jesus? Why was you so scared? Did you not love me enough to tell me? And we don't. We fear what people's going to think of us. We fear we're not going to fit in. Yeah. I've been there. You know, you could be in the President of the United States, which I hope we'd sure say something, but we, would, we just don't say things. Well, they'll think something bad about me. They'll think I'm a, a wacko or extremist. Why well, am I extremist for Jesus Christ? Right. But now on the flip side of that coin, if you're one of the people that quote Scripture 24-7 to everybody, you better wake up and smell the coffee because even as a believer, you'll, you'll, you'll turn away because 
you got to put some practicality with it. If I sit there and quote you the scripture and never give you no practicality, everything, you just quote you scripture after scripture, it's a turnoff. Yeah. Amen? It even is for me, and I love the word. So, Jesus' cost was his life. Now, as we said, he was crucified. And you can go into that in, in, in Matthew chapter 26 and 27 and see that he was crucified. But see, they walked him over, first of all, they walked him over to Cephas' house, which is the father in law of the high priest at that time. Spit on him and did this and put him down in the basement, if you want to call it that. Then they, then they marched him over to Pontius Pilate. And then, after he was condemned, what did they do? They per- the Romans put a purple robe on him, and they gave him a reed, which I call a reed like a tadpole or a cane pole. It's pretty hard. And they put a crown on him. And understand that crown, a lot of people think that that is, um, what do you call them, like a raspberry bush? Thorn. No. It come, you know where it comes from? It comes from a tree. The trees are over there. Them, them things are, are like that. It, and they are super sharp. So what I'm getting at, you know, a little sticker like that that comes to a point, and everybody's been in rose, rose bushes or rat, whatever, but it's nothing like being stuck within that, that real sharp, long uh, needle thing. But anyway, they beat him, okay? It says they beat him. They, they, took, they took, they slapped him, they hit him with their fists and their palms, and they took that reed, if you want to use it as a cane pole, everybody knows what a cane pole is. And they took that and they smacked him on top of the head with that crown, driving that, that in him. They spit on him. And then they put his clothes back on him and marched him out to be crucified. Here's the thing. If you think that that feels good, wow, there's no pain. You understand that time Jesus hung on the cross, you couldn't even recognize Him. That's why it says in Isaiah about you couldn't even rec- uncomely because you couldn't even recognize him. Amen. And he and he did this for you. He did it for you. And he says, imi- like Paul said, imitate me. We're to imitate Jesus. What did Jesus do? Went after the lost. Yeah. And he just didn't. Jesus didn't just uh, uh, say a few words. You understand that Jesus backed it up with power. And as Paul said, I didn't come to hear your persuasive words, your big talk. I come to see the power. What power is he talking about? The lost being won and the actual power, of, and that is the power of the Lord, the gifts operating. That was the normal in the church back in the day. Here's the thing. You need, you need a, something to talk to somebody about you don't know. Ask them if you can pray for them. That's unevancy. If they say no, they say no. Amen. But a lot of times it will. And if God chooses and He heals them immediately, if it's something to do with that, chances are, not always, but a lot of times they'll come to Christ. Not always. Now, it didn't happen always, but a lot of times it did. Jesus in John, John chapter 4, the woman at the well, because everybody knows that story, right? Now, what did Jesus do? The woman come to the well, and Jesus told her that, about her husband's. And she knew that she says, you're the prophet, and da-da-da. And she went into town, but what does it say? The town, most of them got saved. Yeah. Amen? Why was that? Gifts operating through. And the same's true for us. And you look at Philip, he did the same thing. See, you got to start operating in a gift. God's given it to you. But it's about being baptized in the power of the Lord. And you know, people want to shut the door and run away then. Run away then. You know, I, I don't care. Listen, time is too short. And Psalms even talks about that that they say in the day that they've said for years, the Lord's coming, coming, but I'm telling you, the Lord is. Right. You take a look at society right now at this present moment, what's happening in this world. Have you ever heard anything in your whole life? Have you heard your grandparents even talk about it? No, there's never been nothing like this. And there never will be again. It is just where we're at. And so, it's of the essence. Start with your own family. Start with your grandkids. Or, I mean, your, your, your kids, your grandkids. See, this is what we do. Me and my wife uh, babysit our great-grandchildren. 17-month-old, 
And now we got another one thrown in a mix starting Monday, the other great grandchild, 19 month old and the four year old. So our hands are full. And this is usually five, six days a week. And we're older. And it's not an easy thing to do to keep up, but this is a thing. This is where we're supposed to be at because we're teaching them about Jesus Christ. And when you got a four year old that comes up and knows things that I've never even taught him yet, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. And it's nothing to do with being my grandson. I don't care. It could be anybody's. What do we need to do? At that moment, we need to pour all we can into that, sure. that child or person. But we don't. We're too stinking self centered. Here's the thing most of us in here are older. You know what? We say, well, I'm old. I can't do this. Mm -mm. Don't buy it. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, I can't do things I used to do, and I know some people don't can't do. But the thing is, then how's come, tell me this, how's come God gave Caleb the strength at 80 years old as he had his 40 years old hand-to-hand -hand call back? Tell me why that happened. Why did it happen? If it wasn't possible for us, it's in the Word, everything's possible for us. Because God's not no respect for persons. Amen? Amen. So, don't, we can't use that cop out. As a matter of fact, Psalms 92, I forget what verse it is. This is the one. It says you're to bear fruit in old age. Woo well, how am I going to do that? I'm in. Here's the thing, listen. How many people's got a telephone? You all do. Why can you not call a brother or sister or someone, maybe a friend that you don't know the Lord? Why can you not encourage them and talk to them? Now, not getting into the gossip. That's where people step over the boundary line. But why can't you do that? Why can't people write a, a, a card or a letter to people? Why can't you do that? Why can't we bake a pie or something? Why can't we go, go, go visit somebody? We come here. Why can't we go visit outside the four walls? In other words, what I'm getting at, there's no excuse. There's something the Lord has for each and every one of us to do on a daily basis and it's not sit in this pew. Right. If we all want to sit in this pew and you do not want to win the lost, then I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to be here. And I guarantee you, He won't be here. Because what is the purpose? I can go get a social club down to Tavern. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, if you're not out winning the lost, you do not have the fear of the Lord. Right. You realize that? Fear of the Lord, you say, I'll show you a scripture in a minute. Fear of the Lord, you will be out winning the lost. If you're not, I'm going to say, you do not have the fear of the Lord. And I'll show you in scripture. Go to Acts 9.31. What did you just say? The fear of the Lord and they was multiplied? Yeah. So why did they multiply? Because they feared the Lord. Now, let me explain something about the fear of the Lord. There's two different aspects, okay? The fear of the Lord there was a reverence, all fear of the Lord, okay? But when you're disobedient and you're not doing it is an absolute fear. It's an absolute tear in that aspect. It's not a, not a reverence, not an awe. You ought to be scared. Because it says in Matthew, like Matthew 10:28. God has the power to kill both soul and body in hell. Yep. You realize that's power. And if anybody knows anything about hell, that's the last place you want anybody to go, even your worst enemy. See, we have family that won't forgive one another. Somebody got the wheel. Somebody died. Somebody got the money. Somebody got the car. My brother, my sister took this. They did that. And I know people that come to them. They had money. Well, they did this. They did that. I can't get over it. I said, are you willing to let us send you to hell? It's a material thing. Here's the thing. Do you not think that God can give you money if He wants you to have money? Did He not give it in a fish's mouth? Peter or whoever it was, John, go out, open the fish's mouth, and whatever's in there, drink, go pay our tax, temple tax. God, nothing is impossible for God. But we've got, listen, if you walk in unforgiveness and you choose to walk in sin knowingly, I'll tell you what, you're not going to do nothing for the kingdom of God. You're not going to do nothing. But remember this. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, and we may get to it a little bit later, chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, but I think it's in verse uh, 10 or 11. We persuade men knowing the tear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what do you think of when you think of tear? That's a fear. But now, some Bibles say fear in place of tear. T-E-R-R-O-R. The thing is, in the Greek, what that means is exceedingly fear. Exceedingly. In other words, extreme great fear. Why? Do you want to fall in the hands of the living God? We're all going to give an account. You're all going to stand before one or two judgment seats. And I believe everybody here is going before the judgment seat of Christ. But it says to be rewarded for your good and the bad. Yeah. How much bad we're going to have? We ain't out winning the lost. But you don't think that the Lord ain't going to come. And don't think that you're going to make any excuses. Your tongue's going to be glued yeah. to the roof of your mouth. And it's going to be like a big video played. And the evidence is there. And you ain't going to say nothing. But the sad thing is you're going to lose your rewards. You ain't going to have nothing to come before Christ and present and give to Him. Because we wanted our own self inner selfish ways instead of getting out and winning the loss. My goodness, Jesus Christ for five days didn't do nothing but about still win the lost. And we say, well, I don't have time. Here's the thing. You say you don't have time. You're so busy. If I lived in Florida right now, and you're here, and I said, hey, I got a check right here with your name with a million bucks. I can promise you, you would drop everything you're doing and be right down there just like I would. So don't tell me you're too busy. And what's more important than that money? Lost soul. How can we say, how can we say we love the Lord? and not be about the Father's business. How how can we? And just like this, but we have Bible studies and get-togethers, and we never invite the lost. It just becomes that we stay within that that realm. We never reach out. And and so we got to get outside that. But see, we get in cliques in churches because we're comfortable. We don't, we don't want to change a thing. You start changing, people's out the door and gone. If Pastor Gary done something different than what Pastor Mark did, which he don't, but I mean, night and day difference, everybody go out the door. Where did God call you? God's called you to go somewhere to church. Don't think He ain't because Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, do not forsake your assembly and get a space of days go even to make courage one another. It's the Lord's will you go to church. But what are we going to tell the Lord on that day? What are you going to tell Him? Well, I didn't need to go to church. I don't believe that I have to go to church. Once again, once again, I didn't say it. He said it. said it. And if I say anything that you cannot prove in this Word, not taken out of context, if you can't prove it, you need to rebuke me and rebuke me quickly and publicly. Amen. Amen. What did the Bereans do? Everything Paul said, they listened, but it said what? They went home and they looked it up to see if it was true. That way, that way you're not deceived. And understand, people that you know believe certain ways. Let's say uh, believed in uh, eternal security, whether you do or don't. Maybe one of these days I'll probably preach or teach on that from from here. But we put our feelings. We put our feelings in it. And sometimes we put our life experiences, but it don't line up with this. We put that over and higher than the Word of God. And you run into that with with people on the street a whole lot, saying, I don't need church. I've run into them. I can have more church out there. Well, maybe so, but you still not do this. What if I need encouragement? Like it's encouragement to see John today, is it not? And the folks, sure it is. Now if they wasn't here... You know, it would not be the same. Would the Lord still be here? We're two or three together dying. But it just brings a different environment. Amen? So I'm just trying to get the emphasis or the Lord is about winning the lost. Psalms 22. And understand, all this is about winning the lost is Jesus' love. That's what it's about is His love. And we'll go start in verse uh, 14. 
understand a lot of time in Scripture, you can have prophetic that had something to do then and something to do now and something to do in the future. Do you understand that about the Word of God? That all time, sometimes there's a prophetic word that was for then, it's for now, and it's for the future, and they'll tell you. Well, that's just like this about what, what King David says about Jesus. It says in, in verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. Verse 15, My strength is dried up like a potion, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Do you realize what that's saying about Jesus? Every, not one, every joint in your body, every joint, and that includes, this is a joint here too. Every joint, it says, was out of socket, out of place. Everyone, not just, they don't say two or three, does it not say every? Every joint. Every joint was out. You know, I watched a thing one time, a history, a little bit to do with crucifixion, but it was talking about Hitler. Hitler didn't actually crucify people the way Jesus crucified them. But yet, he, he, what he did, he would take a post or whatever, and he would tie people up by their hands and let them hang. Well, the same thing happens. It, it's cruel. It's cruel. It's a, it is one of the worst forms of punishment, if you will. And Hitler did that to the Jewish people. Listen. Every joint was out. Jesus, did, did Jesus know this was going to happen? He, he, he knew about crucifixion. And yet, for His love for the lost, He was willing to sacrifice His own life for me and you. Yep. Now, let's just take, a little, let's take it down a little bit. Jesus, uh, and you have the disciples which came, the twelve apostles, Correct? Do you know, and like Pastor Gary said, only one that we know of did not die. He died by natural death eventually. Now, he was putting boiling oil and on the island of Patmos, and we're talking John, okay? But what about the others? And besides that, who wants to be dipped in a boiling pot of hot oil? Have you ever burnt yourself at a stove with hot frying? My goodness, great will. But yet he didn't deny him, and yet he's right. He's right. He's writing. But look, they have Bartholomew, and they don't know for sure. But they believe that he was he he was skinned alive. They believe that he was skinned alive. And you have uh, well, like Paul, he wasn't. He was beheaded around the age of sixty. You look at James, a brother of Jesus. He was he was speared through with the sword. And a lot of them, even some of them was dragged between horses. A lot of them was, was speared and had their heads cut off. They was beheaded. And why? Why? Did they, you know what? They thought that lost soul was worth it too. And let me tell you, if a person does not accept and come to Jesus Christ as their Lord, what do you think? You can read it in here. What do you think is going to happen to you in the tribulation if you if you don't take the mark of the beast and different things? You think you're going to be happy and live, go lucky? You're going to be just like that. You're going to die an awful, awful death. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but in Jude 23, he said, "I pull them out of some of some people. He does it by fear by pulling them out of the fire." You know what? This is the way I do. Paul did the same thing. Paul was before Felix or one of them. He he preached righteousness, holiness, and judgment to come. He preached on judgment. Why? Because sometimes it takes fear for some people to get their get their eyes opened up. It's all about love, and I'm not trying to scare anybody. But on the flip side, if I love somebody, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And we're not willing to do that. 
Sometimes it takes a wake-up call if Pastor Gary has got his mind made up. Like, here's the thing, Pastor Gary's smart. It's harder to win a smarter person to the Lord. Now, what I mean by that, somebody that, that's like a rocket scientist. They think they know everything. And if they're full of money, they think they're self-sufficient, it's hard to win them to the Lord. Very, very hard. But yet, Jesus, disciples, and people still today die for that person. It's like this. Lord sent me uh, to uh, over to Riley Hospital one day. A, a child, I think she was 13 years old. Uh, lost eyesight in one eye, and the other eye was going blurred, and she was going to lose eyesight. Uh, so I went over there, and I didn't want to, but once again, I gave up what I was doing because I felt the Lord telling me to go. So I went over there, and I prayed. Nothing happened. I prayed again, and she goes, well, this eye's starting to... And so I walked out of the room and said, Lord, and He says, pray a third time, Craig. So I walked in there and prayed a third... And understand, this is nothing to do with me. This is about all of us being obedient. It's all this is. Yes. And boom, her eye was healed. She could see in both eyes. The hospital was excited about it, but guess what? Her mom what didn't. See, that's what I'm saying about everything you do is not always going to have the effect you may want, but it's still being obedient to what the Lord tells you to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, we know that Jesus Christ put His highest value, His highest value, which is His life, for the lost. Now, Jesus thought it was urgent. Because if it wasn't, He wouldn't have been doing that, preaching that to them five days. That's right. And He wouldn't have said that on the cross, so it's urgent. Now, I'll tell you how urgent I believe it is, okay? I believe personally, and I don't know how Pastor Gary believes, it's not a heaven or hell issue, but I believe there's going to be a little scuffle, maybe a war, uh, in Psalms 83 is where a lot of them say it. But I believe there's going to be before you ever get to the Ezekiel War, okay? But the points I'm getting at is you got Iran, you got North Korea, you got Russia, you got China. That's all buddying up now. They're making accords, they're visiting each other. Now North Korea is going to trade weapons for food with Russia. The thing is, everything is getting lined up according to Scripture, okay? And if you believe in pre-trib, I believe the church is out for some of this stuff. Certain things happen. That's right. Okay? So if it is, how close is it to the Lord coming? Here you got all these lined up. You've got the proxies of Iran. Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the Hunis, and Houthis, or however you say it, down in Saudi Arabia and down. And now you've got the accords, who was it? Iran and Saudi Arabia that's making a deal that will take effect next month. You've got all this going on. You've got, what did they say, 150,000 rockets. Hezbollah, or it has to be Hezbollah. Hezbollah has pointed to Israel, and I, I don't have no doubt they do. And all this, this is what I believe. Something's got to happen because when you read in the Ezekiel account, you do not find one, one Muslim nation there. You don't find these proxies there. Now, whether it's actually the country of Jordan, or the proxies that's in them countries, I believe it's the whole ball of wax myself. Because Damascus, you read in your Bible, you read right now, Damascus has never been, never been destroyed. Never has. But yet you find it's flattened. You find in Scripture that people can't live in the northern part of Israel. Why is that? Why could you not live in the northern part of Israel? Because of nukes. This is what I believe. I believe... Everything's going to come against Israel all at one time, and it could be because could be because Israel goes over and strikes Iran's nuclear sites. Sites, not one, sites. They're buried deep in the mountains because the United States keeps backing out of helping them. We keep saying, this is our red line, we're not going to cross it. That red line, we meet it. He says, now this red line, this red line. We're, I bet your money, I don't know, I don't bet. We probably won't even help Israel. Here's the thing, does Israel need our help? <laughs> Not with God in charge. And matter of fact, in Ezekiel War, who helps Israel? Israel don't even fight it. God does it. 
Amen? And that's what we've got to look. See, you can't look to Donald Trump or, or anybody else. You've got to look to Jesus Christ. Now, God may use these people, but our focus gets here and not on Jesus Christ. But that's why I say this is urgent to get the lost one. You realize that when that match is lit over in the Middle East, everything's going at once. Now, not necessarily the Ezekiel War. I believe there will be a little bit of time. But I do believe in a, the proxy war. And I believe Israel is going to take back over. Do you not read this all in the news? You see it. I'm not telling you nothing you, you don't see. Now, I will say this. You don't need to be watching the news 24-7. You're going to get, you're going to get filled of hatred, anger, bitterness if the Lord tells us not to. Everything, 99.9%, it's a lie. They deceive us. You don't think for one moment, I've said this for years, they're coming after the church. If you think they're not, well, how are you ever going to get a one more religion? and a one world government. Who's going to run the church? They're going to tell you who, what, what, through whatever denomination or however that, that's going. They're, they're, they're going to do that. Do you see? We've got to look to the bigger picture that these things are happening, but not get caught up in it and say, oh man, I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to do. You live like Christ is not coming back, but repair like He is. Amen? And we need to go on our business. God put this here for you to enjoy. Amen. And he says, put back, matter of fact, Lord says, put back a little money for a rainy day. Don't go out and say, oh, Lord's come back. Remember when they did that? When was that? What, what, in the 90s or when was that? When, when they said the Lord was coming back and all them people sold their houses and all their. Remember that? Did, did the Lord come back? No. Now what'd they do? Or people go out and take that credit card and I'm going to go out and spend every. I got 28,000 bucks on this card. And all of a sudden, it don't. And you notice the thing about credit cards, they're raising the interest on that. They, you understand that? If you got credit cards and you don't pay that off in a month, you understand that they, there, there's no clause that says they can't raise that to whatever they want to. After one year, they can raise it all. Do you not think they're not going to with the banks and the situations? But they're coming after the church because the church has got money that belongs to the Lord. And they're going to try to come and get that. Amen. What I'm telling you all this is, is the urgency, the urgency of everything. See, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it calls us to be witnesses. But to witness there in the Greek means a martyr. What's a martyr do? I like to use the phrase, that all of us here are old enough to remember, and they still do, that a lot of horses used to have blinders on them. Why was that? So they stay focused when see a snake and all this. That's what the church has got to do, is get the blinders on, singleness of the mind, yep. to get on focus on the Lord and win the loss, not allow all these distractions to get us distracted. Yep. I'm telling you, time is short, and as it says in... Well, it says in a lot of New Testament places in the four Gospels, but Mark chapter 8, and I believe it's the same verses 32 through 34, it talks about what will you give for your soul? Yeah. What will you give? How important is your soul? If your soul, you're going to do anything. You're going to protect it. You're going to give everything. And the Lord says, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Yes. Woo! So, anyway... Let me ask you this, and I'm going to quit. We're never even got, we never get through it. I don't even know why I even write down little bitty notes. Is what cost are you willing to give? Right now, you need to ask yourself, as the Lord is speaking to you, listen, as the preaching has come, the words come, the Lord's brought things to your minds of where we can make change. Listen, if you think you've arrived, I'm sorry to tell you, you have not. If you did, we wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. Amen? We're continually growing glory unto glory. Amen? And we've got to... Listen, if you don't hear anything else said today, be about the Father's business. And not just 
the smile. If time is short, time is urgent, and according to Jesus, then you've got to go beyond that. If I never met you again, do you think I'm going to let that, or, or Pastor Gary, let's take him as an example, yeah. do you think that he's going to let you just walk out and never say nothing to you? Oh, no. You're going to hear the Gospel. Anybody that runs down the road after Jehovah Witness with a Bible ain't going to let you do anything. <laughs> And he, and he did that. Why? Because he loves them enough to show them the Word. In 2 Corinthians, where I was talking about in chapter 5, it says, Paul, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Persuade men. What it means is, Paul wanted to persuade men to have, to have a change of mind through an argument. In other words, showing them the Word of God. Yeah. That's how much fear he had. That's why he said to tear, I persuade men. Do we? Are you going to persuade men? You say, I don't know enough of the Word. I don't care whether you know. You know, if you're a fr- new Christian and you don't know it, you know what? What did Jesus tell the disciples? Don't worry about just study, okay? But don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll give it to you in the last hour. As long as you're praying and in the Word, the Lord will give you what you need. Understand? You realize you could save a rocket scientist if. The Holy Spirit was calling him, and the Lord said, and I don't care if you, you know, all you knew is John 3.16, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, who ever believes in shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Yep. You know what? That's all it's going to take. Yep. Amen? Amen.